really look, looking forward to the, the last Sunday of the month when we will have the bilingual service that gives us a chance to get both groups together. Some of you might not know everybody in the church and when we have a bilingual service again, it helps that we have at least a couple of hours where we can uh, um, greet uh, the different uh, um, people in the church. I'd like you to open uh, your Bible to Psalm 51. You just sing a song. Sometimes I feel that John just reads my memory. But he brought up a song that said, Revive me, O Lord. Revive me, O Lord. I don't know about you, but I need that reviving every day. And we have a song right in front of us, Psalm 51, where Paul, where Peter, I'm sorry, with David, King David, is asking for mercy. He's, he's been going through almost one year of nothing but, you know, he's been in the dumps, as we would say today. And he realizes he's down and he needs to get back up. So I'm looking for a title for this message. I, I came up with two. How to come back when you're down. Or how to recover the cutting edge. Some of you know that I was born, born in Spain but raised in Australia after about a couple of years living in Geelong, which is about 200 kilometers from Melbourne. Um, my parents moved with some of us, moved to a farm, a farmland. And uh, I think it was, I was about 12, 13 years old when my mother and my father said, okay, you have a job after school, and that is to chop wood for the fireplace. <laughs> And uh, there would be days where I could chop so much wood in no time, and other days I'd be working hard at it, and I could, couldn't uh, get uh, any, any, I couldn't advance at all. And of course, this is I had three other brothers who were bigger than me, and my brother Talo said, uh, "Let me show you the secret." So you, all you're getting, you're just whacking the wood because you, you've lost the cutting edge of the axe. I said, does that make a difference? I said, well, you try to cut this piece of wood and then time yourself. And I'd be hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and it would not split. Hard work. But then he said, let me, let's just spend about 15, 20 minutes um, filing down the, you know, the, the, the edge of the ax and see how it works then. And, you know, with very little effort, you just bring the ax down with very little force and the wood just split in two. I understood it wasn't uh, so much in the force, the secret wasn't in the force, it was in the, 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 the sharpness of the axe. So with that thought in mind, let's go to Psalm 51. We'll be reading all 19 verses. This is a psalm that uh, 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 David wrote a few months after he fell in sin with Bathsheba. As you remark, might remember, he fell in adultery and the and, uh, uh, committed adultery with uh, with, uh, with with Bathsheba, and then uh, the husband found, found out. I'm sorry. Very soon later, he tried to kill the husband, and he committed murder so shortly after that. And this is the recovery. This is the the, the psalm that you know, the Lord inspired to David to to recover the cutting edge. I want you to see how interesting this passage is. We read in verse 50, chapter 51, verse one. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to the loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin, my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide my face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore me the joy of my salvation, and behold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressions, transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, they will not despise. Do good in thy, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then shall thy, they offer bullocks upon thine altar. <coughs> we'll be looking at several verses here that will help us get up if you're down. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this Psalm and Psalm 32 were moments in the life of David that were crucial. Moments of restoration. Moments of confession. Moments of getting things right. Moments of recovering the cutting edge in his life. Moments of getting up for he was just uh, rolling in his despair for many months after he committed those horrible sins. Father, we just sang a few moments ago that we need revival. And as we see sometimes the congregation, we understand that this is urgent. We need you back in the center of our lives again. Lord, most of us are busy people. We open up the week on Monday with the heavy schedules. We work hard all day. We plan again for the next day and make things easier. And then little by little we end the week seeing that we haven't really done much progress, especially spiritually. We need to recover our relationship with you. We need to recover the cutting edge so that, Lord, the things that we are to do, we can do it in your power. We need um, revival today. And I pray that this message will help us understand uh, how to get back up when we are down. Lord, use me this afternoon. Uh, give my mind uh, freedom, Lord, to be able to express myself well in English. And Lord, may this message be received with open ears and open hearts uh, and a ready, uh, a ready mind Lord, to put it into practice. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this wonderful song. Lord, it gives us hope when things don't look very, um, don't look well. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of you have probably studied this psalm again, and there's a parallel psalm, which is Psalm 32. Both capture the same time when uh, David had to recover from his fall. He was backsliding terribly, and uh, this psalm came about as a result of David's sin with Bathsheba. He committed adultery, and then in an effort to cover that up, he committed murder. And after a while, David was confronted uh, uh, about his sin by the prophet uh, Nathan. It was only after his sins were made public that David chose to repent. He could have done it much, much earlier. Once he committed adultery, and then he plotted against the husband of Bathsheba, Uriah, um, he, he thought nobody would be able to detect, nobody would be able to do anything about it. And he spent almost a year, one, almost one year, nine months and something, according to some commentators, for him to actually deal with this problem. Now that's a long time, because during this time, you will see in the psalm, 
and in Psalm 32, that he lost his joy, the joy of his salvation. And he became a very miserable person. It was during this time that, of repentance and soul searching that David wrote this psalm. And in these verses he expresses the heartfelt need of a believer to be right with God. Now you say, what does that have to do with me and you? You know, it has a lot to do with us because, you know, there are times when we just get comfortable. As long as I go to church, I'll be okay. As long as I read my Bible, I go through the motions, I'll be okay. But where is the excitement? Where is the joy of the salvation? Where is the desire to serve the Lord with a wholeheartedness? Sometimes we uh, we calm down, we... we uh, we, we want to move on, but, but we walk around discouraged and maybe even defeated. And so we have a psalm here that will help us get up when we are down, when we have fallen. <laughs> and I find here in this uh, chapter uh, three points that I'd like to explore with you. First of all, we need to understand that even though we are saved, we have the capacity to sin. The capacity for sin in the saint. And then we need to understand also that there is consequences when we live in that situation, in that, in that kind of condition. The, the consequences are sin for the saint. And we'll see seven things that sin will do in our life. The capacity, the consequences. And then I have good news for you because uh, David here gives us a way to come back. The comeback from sin for the saint. And we will see how David managed to do that. The first thing we need to look at, first of all, is the capacity for sin in the saint. If you look at chapter 51, verses 1 and 4, you see that, it, you know, even though you might be a saint, maybe you're redeemed, you still have the sinful nature that drives you to sinful behavior. And David puts it this way, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the loving kindness, according unto thy multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Here David is confessing that he's, even though he is, remember, the man who has a heart according to God's heart, he is able, he, he, he's, uh, he is prone to sin. Notice verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3 and 4 says, For I acknowledge my transgressions. David is now tired of hiding that or ignoring that. He needs to deal with this and he has to confess this situation before God in order to come back up. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin, notice the words there, the second sentence, is ever before me. The Holy Spirit is making sure that he sees that every day. Uh, they, they are it ever before me. And then notice how the words that he, the Holy Spirit gives him here to express uh, who he has offended. Verse 4, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. We are prone to sin. You might say, well, you know, but if I got saved, then I probably would never sin again. I came across somebody back in Madrid years ago, uh, a group of evangelicals that were in the main square, in the square of Cervantes, that were having a, a evangelist, evangelistic rally. And they, they were doing a pretty good job, actually. When they finished, I came across the leader there, and I, I engaged in conversation. And somehow I noticed that his theology was quite wrong. When he talked about when he got saved, he said, I got saved about 15 years ago. And then he said, I haven't sinned since. And I said, you haven't sinned in 15 years? I said, you just lied. You just fell in sin. I don't know how he got the, the idea that when you are saved, you will never fall into sin. We need to understand that with the new nature, we still have the old nature. We're still able to sin. Paul picks up this in Romans chapter 6, verse 13 and 40, 14. He says, Neither you, ye, your members, as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but you yourselves unto God. If he's saying this, it's because we can yield 
our members as instruments of unrighteousness. But Paul is saying you don't have to do this. You have what you need in order to be successful and victorious. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Then he goes into chapter 7. Remember that chapter is an amazing chapter where he starts talking about the things that he wants to do and is not doing. And the things that he doesn't want to do and somehow his flesh leads him to do it. And then as you close chapter 7 and open chapter 8, he has this verse where he says, Oh wretched me, who would deliver me from this um, uh, uh, um, how does it say this body is the word for this body of sin of, of death I'm sorry like if he was taken somehow this old uh, Paul along with him uh, which was corrupted and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 we see here uh, they have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, free from idolatry. Joseph managed to do that when um, Potiphar's wife offered herself to him. He literally fled from that situation. But David, instead of fleeing, which would have been the way out, he decided to uh, think about it twice and... Uh, um, he can see the sin in his own heart. Remember, I think I can share with you the story of one of the missionaries, Brother Munson. Many, many years ago, he came with about 19 of his members from Germany. Uh, from one of the, uh, Brother Munson was a pastor of one of the churches that supports us from, from Germany. And he came with very strong young soldiers, American soldiers. And uh, they came to do evangelism, to help us with the work. I don't know, maybe you remember that time. And after about a week of hard work, my brother Munson said, Sammy, you know, these guys need some rest. You know, we're in the coast of the south. Is there, are there any beach around here that is safe to take them? I said, no. <laughs> and he kind of graded it. He says, is there any G-rated beaches? G-rated in the movies would be for kids. Is there any safe places where you don't have to, you know, get to run away from a situation? So I looked for about a day and a half, and I said, you know, there is a place I know which is quite barren. It's over there in Tremolinos by the golf course. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's hardly anybody there. At least that day when I went, there wasn't anybody. It was kind of deserted. I said, well, this will be a perfect place to take these seven strong men to have a bath, to have, you know, bathe in the, in the beach. So I took him over there, and, uh, you know, it was pretty good. There was nobody around for about 300 kilometers around. And... Uh, the guys have a, had a great time. Then we went over to the showers to wash away the salt. And about a hundred meters away, this young lady came topless directly to the showers. I didn't know where to hide. <laughs> and I told Brother Munson, what do we do? And he smiled back to me and said to the guys, guys, the first look is free, the second is sin. Well, what did it mean by that? You know, temptation can be there, and then you can flee, run away from it. But then sometimes you consider it in your own mind and fall right into the trap. And this is what I'm referring to when I said that, you know, we have the capacity to sin. We might be the saints as Paul presents it in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, all the way to verse 6. But we are still we still have the sinless nature. So any saint who claims total sinless perfection is in a terrible state of self deception. In First John chapter one verse eight through ten it says, "If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins." and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not, not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not with us. You know, salvation, I'm sorry, sin cannot take away our salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. 
by sinning, but it does tear us down spiritually and emotionally. It weighs heavy on our soul. And so, as long as we occupy these bodies, you know, with sinful um, things, we will lose our spiritual appetite. We will lose our spiritual desire. We will lose the urge to serve, to serve the Lord. So here, even David, a man after God's own heart, confesses that he has sinned against God. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it says, And when he had recovered him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, Notice how God himself describes this great man called David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So you wonder, what happened here, David? How were you, um, uh, how, how does Paul use, what words he uses in Galatians? How you bewitched, how you were somehow, um, um, you were nullified in your mind, somehow you brought down your, your protection? What, what happened here, David? How come not only you sinned against Bathsheba by committing adultery and then plotted against her husband to kill him, but then for about nine months, he thought nobody would ever discover it. He thought he could get away with it. He could, that nothing uh, would uh, keep it from moving on in his life. But he found out very soon the consequences of sin. The consequences of sin for the saint. In Psalm 51, uh, it, is, it is written, it was written by a sinning saint. He knew full well the consequences and begins with a plea for mercy. Look at verse 1 again, 51, 1. Have mercy upon me. Now the interesting thing about this verse is that it is all in capital letters. In the Spanish translation, the same thing. Have mercy of me. It's almost like a cry shouting out. When you write everything in capital letters, it's like a, 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 a long, a big cry, a loud cry before the Lord. Have mercy upon me, O God. Not because I love you. Notice why. According to thy loving kindness, according to, unto thy multitude of the tender mercies, not because of who I am, but because of who you are. So never, never be deceived. Sin carries its own club, and they, your sins, will find you out. As we see in Numbers 32, 20, 23, be sure, the Lord says, that your sins will find you out. Now this is a warning from God. And I'm going to show you from this passage, Psalm 51, six consequences, six, six, uh, six things that take place when we are down, when we are with lost fellowship, when we are backsliding. Now, just because we're here this afternoon does not, make, does not mean that we're not backsliding. We can be here, you know, even with a big smile and still be backsliding, be down. So notice the six consequences that, uh, that uh, David mentions. First of all, in verse 2, it says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. From this, I see that sin soils the saint. And David is clean. He seeks cleansing. We see that very clear. Look at verse 9 and 10. Hide, my faith, uh, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew, talking about revival, renew a right spirit within me. Lord, make things right. I, want, I don't want anything to um, hinder our relationship. So sin soils the same. The non-Christian might not have difficulty with his sin, but a Christian, a saint, will, because he has the Holy Spirit there, kind of, you know, pressing with his, with his thumb on the area that needs to be uh, uh, affixed 
the saint will not be able to, I'm sorry, the saint will not be able to sin and get by with it. So first of all, we see with David that he's, he realizes that he's dirty. Uh, yes, he's got a heart according to God's heart, but at this point in his life, he notices, he knows that um, his heart is not right. And notice the second thing, the second consequence in verse 3, sin saturates the mind. Look at verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. It's in front of me all the time. You know, I don't know about you, but before I was saved, I could just live in sin and don't care, didn't mind. I didn't have anything inside of me saying it except my conscience, and that was pretty uh, nullified. I could get away with it, or at least I thought about it, I thought I could. It didn't seem to bother me, but right after I got saved and the Holy Spirit came inside of me, doing the same things that I did before I was saved, it bothered me tremendously to the point I couldn't sleep at night. And who was doing that? Before it did, I could sleep like a like a baby, but after salvation, I could see that that sin was something that God was just bringing before me, saturating my mind. <clears throat> so David's sin was always on his mind. And I believe he's going to sin and forget about it, but the Christian will have that sin on his mind until it is dealt with. The Holy Ghost in our heart will not allow us to forget about it. You know, you can wound the mind with two things, with guilt and with sorrow. I heard somebody speak about these two things and he said sorrow, sorrow will heal because it's a, it's a clean wound, but guilt festers and infects the whole of life until it is dealt with. And it will manifest itself in temper, bad temper, in lack of concentration, in irritability, no prayer life, lack of appetite for spiritual things. When sin is there and is not being dealt with, you know, we become the worst people to mingle with. Have you? Somebody said that, the, uh, you know, a, a lost person can be difficult to live with. But I believe a born-again believer who's lost his relationship with God can be probably the, the most difficult person to live with. Well, they, they somehow develop this irritability, this temper, that again, they, they don't seem to concentrate well, they don't seem to aim at things properly, they're going everywhere. And, and, they, and when, you, when you talk about prayer life, there's very little prayer life and lack of appetite for spiritual things. Have you read the Bible? Well, maybe tomorrow. How about the church? Well, you know, I've got busy and so on. You have, there's no real interest for spiritual things. But the Lord can deliver us from these things, from these effects, if we come to Him. In Psalm 34, 4, it says, I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. You know, guilt can eat you up, but it doesn't have to, because Jesus offers cleansing and forgiveness. I want you to see the third thing, the third consequence if we let sin uh, just take uh, control. Verse 4, he says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. What I get from this is that sin, sin stings the conscience. David hurt uh, a lot of people because of this sin. But ultimately, his evil was against the Holy God. I, I, I just, I'm really impressed with that first sentence. Against the, comma, the only. Like really the, yes, it's hurt many people. But what I'm concerned about, how it's hurting our relationship. This is a, a sin against you, Lord. Yes, it hurt that Siva, she lost her husband, and it hurt uh, many other people. During that time, David became very irritable. He became very judgmental. He became very 
a resistant. He wasn't an easy person to live with. And that was because he was resisting the Holy Spirit. He was quenching the Holy Spirit. He was saddening the Holy Spirit. And if we truly say the Holy Spirit will make sure that to bring conviction to our conscience and he will sting the conscience. Number four, we see that in verse 8 and 12, sin saddens the heart. Verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness. What, what's going on in the mind of David right here? There's, there's no joy. He's lost that joy of his salvation. Later on, he prays for that joy of salvation to come back. But now he says, make me to hear the joy of gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. The bones which thou hast broken, it's not the Holy Spirit brings so much pressure against, against David's conscience that it feels like his whole body is just crushing. This is the doing of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy <coughs> spirit. I need the Spirit to come and take control again. <clears throat> Friends, sin stings the conscience and then sin saddens the heart. Joy is something that we can lose. True joy is not affected by circumstance or difficulty. It is, however, affected by sin. Notice the fifth consequence that David speaks about in verse 8. Sin sickens, listen now, sickens the body. Did you know that uh, uh, living in um, in a backsliding way can make you sick physically. Look at verse eight again. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou has broken may rejoice. David's sin has begun to take a spiritual toll in his life, and you know that's what sin does. It can damage our health. In fact, if you every time we have the Lord's Supper, what do we what passage do we mention? First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse thirty and thirty-two. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be just, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. There were some kind of Christians over there in the church of Corinth who were walking weak physically. And some were sickly. They, they didn't, you know, no matter what they did, no matter how much uh, care they took of their body, they were always walking, you know, coming down sick. And some had even died, and many sleep. So because the sin replaces joy and peace with worry and fear, it has an impact on the ability to be well. I don't know how many have said, you know, I'm starting to say it to sound like Brother Eddie. I talked to him a week ago, but when, we, when he was still here, and you know, when he was sick, I, I would call him and say, how are you doing, Brother Eddie? Oh, I'm in bed. I mean, I've, been, I've been in bed all day. I'm not feeling well, and, and uh, uh, what do you take? He says, well, Sammy, between you and I, I spend all day confessing my sins, even the sins I haven't committed. You know, I know it's a cry. I said, Brother Eddie, you know better than that. Just, just in case. Just in case. He was there laying in bed, you know, thinking, why am I, am I in bed and not out there? And he would start thinking, and doubt would come to him and say, maybe, maybe, maybe there's something that the Lord is trying to do with me. The Lord may be putting myself on my back and looking up so I remember who I need to have in consideration. So folks, listen, sin sickens the body. And then uh, look also in, in verse 10, sin sours the spirit. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What does this mean? How do, how do you put this into daily, into daily environment? You know, when, you, when you're living with somebody who has lost fellowship with God, who says, you know, I am the same, I am saved, I'm a born-again Christian, 
but have, has lost his relationship, has lost his fellowship with God, they tend to create or develop a very sour, very um, uh, amigo, a very bitter spirit. And sin, I mean, and, and David is experiencing it here. David had a, a wrong spirit. And if that had gone on for a long time, it was like he was very judgmental with the smallest things. Always ready to put blame on others while living in sin himself. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we see that God was fed up with this situation, this hiding away from God. Like I said, it was about nine months to a year that David had been going on with, with this until God said, I'm going to send John, uh, uh, Nathan, the prophet, to deal with David. And this was the last straw. This was the last, I mean, if David did not respond well at this moment in his life, God would have killed him. Are you listening? David was holding back, resisting God, not really wanting to confess. Maybe because he thought, I'm untouchable, I'm the king. Who's going to be, who's going to be able to do anything against me? Nobody's, I can just put my finger on somebody and, and order their execution. Who would even dare to point their finger at me? And he had this sour spirit. And I want you to see it in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. Notice how Nathan comes to David and tries to deal with this problem. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There are two men in one city. He tells him a little story. The one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little iwi lamb. Iwi, I've never heard that word before. You. Is that something you say in Ireland? See you. We, we, you. 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 You, okay. Which he had brought and nourished up, and he grew up together with him and with his children, and he did eat of his meat. He just ate him up. And drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take off his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was coming to him. In other words, he cooked it very nicely. And David's anger, notice how he responded to this action. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to, the, to the Nathan, As the Lord liveth this man that had done this thing shall surely die. Oh, you see that bitter attitude? He was more concerned about a lamb than the life of a person. Very judgmental and was willing to bring down the axe on any other person's sin. But then Nathan said, and he shall, notice, not just surely die, well, if he's dead, he can't restore anything, can he? I think he's, going to, he's got his priorities right. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold. But if he's dead, he's like, he can't do this. I mean, he's just coming out of this. He's just sprouting this without any control. Because he did this thing. And because he had no pity. David, look at yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror. Every morning when you get up, what do you see? He had no pity with Bathsheba. He had no mercy with uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. To the point he, he developed a, a very filthy plot to kill this man. At the end thinking, my hands are clean, I had nothing to do with it. Look, he died in battle. Nobody can accuse me. Nobody can point their finger saying that I'm responsible of his death. And he's saying this about a man who took somebody else's lamb. And notice what Nathan responded. And Nathan said unto him, unto David, Thou art the man. How dare Nathan say this to the king? And he 
keep on reading in that chapter, you find that, Nate, that finally, finally, David responds with confession. It finally stung him so bad, so hard in his conscience and in his heart that he asked for forgiveness. And thanks to that, Nathan, inspired by the God himself, said, your, your life will be spared. That was the last, last straw. That God was ready to bring down the axe upon David and get it out of the way because he had been resisting day after day after day after day, showing him you know, these things that we mentioned before, uh, and, the, and the Holy Spirit was making sure that David got the point, but David was resisting. You know, the backslider will be uh, critical, will be sour, will be judgmental. The same in sin is impossible to satisfy and quick to attack others to make themselves look better. They have spiritual indigestion. They feel miserable. They attempt to compensate by pushing their pain off on others. All you have to do is confess. But we have one more that I'd like to show you, and that's in verse 13 and 15. Sin seals the lips. It keeps us from giving testimony of the things that God has given us. In verse 13, it says, Then will I teach transgressions thy ways. Once this is clear, once this is corrected, then will I teach my transgressions thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Uh, deliver me from blood guiltiness. David, you're not confessing right. You are the one that killed, that killed Uriah. O oh God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy <laughs> Righteousness. Verse 15. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Sin seals the lips. It keeps you from witnessing to others. It keeps you from talking to others about the greatness of your God. They would need to get right. At this point, his lost, his shout, his excitement. He's lost, as he says there, I will sing, but now he's lost his song. And he's lost his testimony. And he says, Lord, I need that back. I'm so miserable. And God made sure, and the words that he uses there is like, you know, the oppressing arm. Your, your hand was so heavy upon me that I felt like my bones were being crushed. Conviction was kicking in. And he uses very poetic language like, and my the green, the, the lush green spiritual life that was in me now is dying away. There's no life anymore. So we see the capacity for sin in the same. We see the consequences of sin for the same. It soils the same. It saturates the mind. It stings the conscience. It saddens the heart, it sickens the body, it sours the spirit, and it seals our lips. When was the last time that you had so much joy in your heart that you couldn't keep it in and you need to share with somebody? I don't know if you see yourself reflected here. I know there's been times in my life where I felt this way. And there's nothing more difficult to deal with than a person who's lost fellowship with God. But I got good news for you this afternoon. There's a camp comeback. We can sharpen the axe again. The comeback from sin for the same. Even though we can or perhaps have fallen into sin, we can come back. You might say, well, how? What do I need to do to recover the cutting edge? What do I need to do to get up now that I've been down for so long? Well, I suggest there's three things here, and we see them in this chapter. Have the confidence. Listen, please, listen to me. Just because you're in the dumps right now does not mean that God doesn't love you. Have the confidence that God still loves you. Look at how Pete, uh, David 
writes in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to what? Thy loving kindness. David has no doubt that God loves him. In fact, he knows that God loves him because God has been dealing with him like a son. And he amplifies that according unto the multitude, multitude of thy tender mercies. Lord, you are you're merciful. You want to uh, restore me. And you want to do this because of your loving kindness. So, dear brother and sister in Christ, if you're in the dumps today, if you feel like identified with what we have seen already, never doubt God's love. He loves you and wants to restore you. Now, Satan will tell you that God doesn't care. He will lie to you. That He doesn't really love you. That He might even say that it's true with you, right? God, how can God have any, any dealings with you in a situation in which you're in? Satan will tell you this. But, but we, we know something about Satan, that he is a, a liar and a murderer from the beginning. John chapter uh, 8, verse 44, uh, Jesus himself describes the devil this way. He's a liar from the beginning. He's a murderer from the beginning. He just wants to kill and destroy. So he'll tell you, like, God doesn't really care for you. He doesn't really love you. How can he love you being such a miserable sinner? He is through with you, wants nothing to do with you again. But remember, he's a liar. God is not through with us. Paul puts it this way in Romans 5.20. He says, for great sin, there is great grace. In Romans 5.20, he says, moreover, the Lord entered that the offense might abound, but when sin abounded, this is where David is, grace did much more abound. David needed abundant grace, and what moved him to the throne of grace was understanding that God loved him in spite of what he had done. But God was not happy where he was. And God it might not be, if you feel identified in this situation, God is not happy where you are. God wants to restore us. So first of all, have confidence that God still loves you. Second thing, we see in verse 4, confess your sins to God. Notice verse 4, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Oh, I've hurt my wife. I've hurt my kids. I've hurt other brothers and sisters in the church with my testimony. I've hurt so many people, but ultimately, I hurt you. Oh my God, against thee the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David confesses sins and acknowledges God's right to judge. God is not looking for excuses, He's not looking for alibis. God is looking for honesty. He just wants us to confess, to agree. If you were to look at the word confess, you find it in 1 John 1 9, where it says, When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, uh, forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess there, if you look at it in the dictionary, I found that the, uh, the description very interesting. It's, it's like putting yourself right beside God, looking at what you had just done, and God says, how do you see that? Well, I'm, it's okay. Well, I see it as sin. What do you think? Well, I, I don't think it's that bad, really. Well, then you, you or I are wrong. Um, you, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm lying. Are you calling me a liar? Because I see that this is wrong, but you don't seem to mind. I remember, again, I learned a lot from my kids when they were growing up. But I remember doing this with them. I said, listen, mom told you to clean that room. And uh, you had all afternoon to clean the room, and I just went into the room, and it still look, looks like a tornado has hit it. But then I spent half an hour cleaning it. Well, let's go together and see what might be wrong. And I said, look at those clothes. They're all laying in the floor. Well, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, they're going to use them tomorrow. 
Yeah, but they're not supposed to be. They're going to use the bar, put them in the closet. And I notice that the garbage can is full. Yeah, but you know, there's nothing in the floor anymore. Yeah, but the garbage, you need to empty the garbage can. You know, I would be telling him all these things, and sometimes he would bring up all kinds of excuses. And so I have to say, you know what, if you show this to your mom, what do you think she's going to say? Have you ever seen yourself in that situation? If you, see, if you have your mom come and do the inspection, and she's much neater than dad is, what do you think she's going to say? And so by, if we confess our sins, it means that we put ourselves before, by the Lord, and say, Lord, how do you see it? The Lord says, that's sin. I don't like that. You know, that, that has to be dealt with. That has to be, you have to get rid of that. And he says, what do you think? Well, uh, you're God, and you're right, so, although I'm, I don't see anything wrong with it, I have to trust you, I have to agree with you. So this idea of confession of sin is putting yourself before a holy God and saying, Lord, I agree with the way you see things. It's not how I see things, it's how you see things. You know, when my wife leaves uh, the cleaning to me and she goes away for the whole afternoon, she says, Sammy, I need to you know, you need, I, I have a lot of things I need to do this afternoon. Will you please pass the vacuum cleaner to the whole house? I don't like passing the vacuum, vacuum cleaner. And, and would you mind uh, uh, emptying the dish uh, washer? And uh, would you, yes, she would go on and on and say, you know, that's it. I have all that to do clean. And since I know she's very demanding, I would go with, the, you know, for me, Go to the vacuum cleaner, go well, just like this, open the house and finish in five seconds. That's good for me. It's good for <laughs> others in the room. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, passing the cloud, trying to get the dust away, just the main things. And then, why don't you, why don't you lift the things and clean well? You know, since I knew that she was so demanding, I would just go like this and then, oh, hold on a second, she's coming later. And she goes, see, she has, she has. She has supernatural eyes. She's got the eyes of Superman. She can see through it everything. She doesn't really, but it seems like she has. So understanding how she thinks that she sees things, I clean a pass the vacuum cleaner under the beds. Which I never did. If she was, you know, I had my way. I would just get the clothes, open the closet, throw them on there, and then you know, it's clean. Understanding how she, her demand, I do a thorough job. Now consider God being the one that says, let's do some cleanup. Let's clean house. Then we'll see how you see. So folks, have the confidence that God still loves you. Confess your sins. Be open about it. And then allow God to cleanse you. Look at verse 7. No, we're close. Purge me with his son. Now, and I shall be clean. Wash me and it shall be whiter than snow. I discussed this verse with my son Gabriel. He said, Daddy, did you ever check Daddy? He still calls me Daddy. He's 41 years old. And he said, Daddy, did you ever consider verse 7, what it means? And I said, yeah. It says, purge me for, uh, with his son. Yeah, but what is it trying to really say? Because David has already confessed his sin. And why is he pounding on this? He says, the idea that David has here is not just cleanse me, I mean, confess your sin, but Lord, cleanse me from the idea, from remembering, from you know, letting it come back to me again and again and again. Cleanse the idea, the, the, the whole experience, I don't want to even deal with that again. So it's not that you have to be cleansed again and again, it's that we need to have the Lord invade our mind to renew our mind. So allow, allow God to cleanse you. Then we request a cleansing. And when we allow God to cleanse us, great things take place. You want to know what things take place? The mountains of our guilt is removed. Our condemnation is taken away. We are free from the voice of the accuser pointing his finger constantly at what we have done, the devil, our sins is buried in the grave of forgiveness and forgetfulness, 
and he removes the penalty and pollution of our sin and he restores the joy he receives us back into close fellowship with him you might say Stanley, why, why are you preaching on this and you point the finger at any of us listen no I'm, I'm just bringing this over to you and to myself to remind us that we can lose fellowship and we can come to a point where we don't care anymore as long as I read my Bible every once in a while, <clears throat> as long as I give the Lord an hour, hour and a half on Sunday, I'm okay. No, folks. If we stay in that state of sinfulness, in that state of um, backsliding condition, we will lose our joy. We will lose our effectiveness. We won't have the urge, the desire to share Christ with anybody else. We won't have, we'll lose our witness. We will lose our song. When it comes to come to, when, when, it, when it comes to come to the church and sing it, we might even just be like looking at the bugs crawling on the ceiling. Open your mouth like you know, like if we were singing. But where is the song in our heart? The the you know, every time I have to sing, I need to kind of tune myself up thinking this is not just singing, Sammy, this is worshiping. This is Whatever you're singing in the screen needs to be true in your life. Are you singing lies? Or are you singing truth? So I need to get myself in shape and say, okay, now let me concentrate on what I'm going to be singing to the Lord. I want it to be true. And if I find that anything there is not true, I need to come before the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, I've lost. I've lost it. Lord, I, I, I'm not happy with it. I see that as you see it. It is wrong. I'm not right before you. And I need to correct it. Otherwise, there will be consequences. There will be, you know, like I said before, sin soils the same, sin saturates the mind. We won't be, it won't leave us. It will just be there. It will even take our sleep away, our rest away. Sin stings the conscience. It saddens the heart. No joy anymore. And if you stay like that for long enough, you might even get sick. You become sour. And then there's no desire to share Christ with others anymore. I'm so glad that there's a way to come back. Going back to the illustration uh, that I had before with my brother Talo. That was cutting, you know, chunks of wood that we cut from the eucalyptus tree around the, the farm. But sometimes when the chainsaw didn't work, we had to cut down eucalyptus tree with the axe. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever tried to cut a eucalyptus tree. That's the hardest wood to cut down, especially when it's still moist. When it's dry, it's very brittle, you know, it'll fall in pieces. But when it's, when it's wet, when it's still green, you know, you can, you can hit with a very strong axe, it bounces right back at you. There's no way you can uh, drive that axe into the wood. And if it's not sharpened, all you'll be doing is on the wood. You're not going anywhere. So again, when I said, Talo, how come now we're not using the axe, we're using the chainsaw. It says the chainsaw needs to be sharpened also, Sam. So after a few cuts, we noticed that the chain would not drive into the wood. And then you had to press it hard, and it wouldn't go in. It would take, it would take normally five minutes to cut a, a, a log, you know, a tree trunk this size, this diameter. It would take us much longer. We'll be sweating. We wouldn't move. And so I said, bring it over here, Sam. And we would spend like 15, 20 minutes filing each one of those uh, uh, teeth. I don't know how you call them in English. You find them to the point when you go like this with your thumb, it would almost dive into your skin. Each one, very carefully, clean it up, and then once again you go with that chainsaw and right across that hard eucalyptus wood, it would just dry through like if it was butter. So easy. But you have to have sharp teeth or a sharp axe. If we don't, take heed of what David is saying here, we can find ourselves chopping harder and harder and harder, achieving less and less in our life. 
how to recover the cutting edge, how to come back when you're fallen. We have the capacity to sin, but remember God loves you. There's consequences for sinning, but I'm sure glad there's a way to come back. I don't know where you are this afternoon. I'm not, I really don't know what your spiritual condition is this afternoon. But if you see any of the points here, you identify with any of the points here, I urge you to make things right with God, to recover the cutting edge. So that there will be a song in your heart to sing. There will be a desire to share the wonderful things that God has given you. To be able to enjoy life. To be able to enjoy your Lord. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Father, I pray that if you see any sin in my life, you very directly will point your finger at it Make me aware of it so that I can see it as you see it, confess it as you want, in order to keep it from hindering our relationship. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here. But I'm not preaching to anyone in particular, but to all of us in general, so that if we see any of these conditions in our own life, you will help us recover. You will bring revival again. But let Lord, may we not just yawn and, and just move on thinking that we can, we can, we can still um, achieve things in this state. It will be so, so much harder. And then those around us would see clearly that we have fallen very far away from God. You want fellowship with us, Lord. You, your loving kindness draws us to you. Sometimes you, you have to use force to bring us back, like you did with David. The Lord let us not hold back as long as David did to the point of sending somebody to tell us that that is the last opportunity that we have. And then there'll be severe consequences. May we all here make things right with you. So that, Lord, we will can enter this week with a different spirit. With a victorious spirit. With a spirit that people can see and identify as with Christ Jesus himself. That people can see the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit in us. This is what you want to see. And so, Lord, I pray that you will use this message in our life in a mighty way. Show us the way back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.